Hello, and thank you for joining me for today's module entitled Comorbidity and Mood Disorders. I'm Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto. I'm also Head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit, Universal Health Network in Toronto, and Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation. The objectives of today's module are to discuss and review common psychiatric and medical comorbidity in people who have mood disorders. And secondly, which I think is a very interesting part intellectually and academically, is to identify what are the, the substrates, what are the underlying systems that would help us understand why people who have mood disorders are more susceptible to a whole host of psychiatric and medical concurrent conditions. Throughout our modular series, we've been really, on many occasions, pressing the point that psychopathology should and is, in fact, conceptualized domain-based. In other words, as opposed to looking at schizophrenia and bipolar and major depression and other common and severe brain-based disorders separately, it's in fact much more coherent and comprehensive and frankly instructive to look at psychiatric disorders or brain-based disorders collectively and look for points of commonality. And the research domain criteria authored by the NIH provides a, a framework, a heuristic, where it operationalizes different domains of psychopathology. The idea here is, is that if we have a more refined domain-based conceptualization, that should provide much more insight as to what is the underlying neurobiology subserving these processes. Why I'm bringing that up today is, is because many of the brain-based processes that lead to major depression or bipolar disorder also help us explain some of the comorbidity. For example, we typically think about diabetes mellitus as a peripheral problem in glucose insulin homeostasis, which indeed it is. But we've also learned that the brain regulates peripheral glucose insulin homeostasis. So it stands to reason that brain-based disorders like Alzheimer's disease, major depression, bipolar, may be associated with a much higher rate of diabetes because of this brain convergent substrate. And that indeed is the case. For example, we know that 80%, 80 percent of people with Alzheimer's disease have some degree of insulin resistance. And in part, we believe that's because the brain is also uh, exhibiting alterations in how it is influencing insulin. So we talk about the overlap between mood disorders and comorbidity. Our interests in terms of finding the substrates extend beyond bioenergetics. In earlier modules, we've also talked about disturbances in inflammation that help us understand why individuals have uh, much higher rates of obesity or diabetes or metabolic syndrome. We also know that many people who have mood disorders have much higher rates of dementing disorders, vascular and Alzheimer's for example, and in part this is because of the increase in inflammation. We're also not abandoning monoamines. Many people who have, for example, disturbances like depression or bipolar also have problems with substance and alcohol misuse. And in part, this is because there's a common disturbance in the area of reward or dopamine or catecholamine signaling. So there's a lot of interest now in not only understanding what are the types of comorbidities, but also trying to really, uh, really in fact, cascade down and unravel what are the underlying substrates that subserve these conditions. Recently, one of our colleagues, um, Rene uh, Reguette, has really, in fact, brought our attention to the implications of uh, air pollution on, on psychopathology. There's a growing literature indicating that air pollution is linked to, in fact, suicidality. And this link could, in part, be due to the fact that the ingestion or the inhalation of, for example, particulate matter may ignite in local inflammatory processes in the human brain that consequently have deleterious effects or abnormal effects on normal brain function, manifesting as impulsivity and suicidality. This still remains a testable hypothesis, but one very concerning given the staggering uh, levels of uh, pollution that are being seen in many parts of the world, bringing our attention to social determinants of health, uh, including not only economics and uh, sociodemographic, but also air pollution. So the most common of the comorbidities that we see in major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder turns out to be the anxiety disorders. 
For a long time, we thought alcohol in substance use disorders were the most common comorbidities in bipolar, for example, but it turned out that it is the anxiety disorders. Now, individuals who have bipolar disorders have more comorbidity than any other psychiatric disorder, and, and indeed, uh, the great majority of people with bipolar have some type of psychiatric comorbidity around 75 to 85 percent lifetime. For major depression, the rates are also very high. The majority have these conditions. And for too many people, the comorbid comorbidity condition, in fact, predates uh, the onset of major depression or bipolar, at least observably. In other cases, it follows. And this idea of which came first is very interesting because it seems as though that, for example, in bipolar disorder, for people who have drug and alcohol misuse, clearly the outcome is much worse than someone who does not have drug and alcohol misuse. But if, in fact, the drug and al alcohol misuse is followed by the onset of bipolar disorder, then, at least observably, then the outcomes in these conditions may be a little better than the reverse temporality of events where, in fact, the drug and alcohol misuse preceded the onset of in this case, bipolar disorder. So rather than, in fact, encumber ourselves with the different interactions that occur between comorbid conditions and major depression and bipolar, my message is, is that we have a common substrate that subserves in many conditions comorbidity, and which one came first may say a few words about the underlying brain process. There's a notion called heterotypic continuity versus homotypic continuity. And homotypic continuity is when the phenotype remains the same across time. Heterotypic continuity is when the condition changes across time. So we've all heard many patients who will tell us that they've had ADHD as a child, and then as an adult they have bipolar. Is this comorbidity, or is this an example of heterotypic continuity? The same vulnerability manifested itself differently phenotypically across time. One of the other common conditions we see is ADHD. And certainly I don't want to forget to mention binge eating disorder affecting a very large percentage of people. We've also learned that binge eating is very much, of course, linked to obesity, and that's linked to drug and alcohol misuse. This is very interesting. This is an example of how understanding comorbidity patterns can tell us, or at least give us some insight onto etiology. Simply put, the more alcohol in drugs people use, the less likely they will abuse food. The more people abuse food through binge eating, the, more, the less likely they're going to abuse drugs and alcohol. And we've seen this competing addiction hypothesis support empirically through several lines of research. I already started off talking about the link between mental disorders, specifically major depression and bipolar, and metabolic syndrome and metabolic disorders. And the link seems to be in part explained by inflammatory changes as a result of having major depression and bipolar. We've talked about social determinants, but also involves alterations in insulin signaling and other types of protein systems. Indeed, alterations in the microglial activation in the human brain, the macrophage of the brain, have been well observed in people with major depression or bipolar. And we know what's happening in individuals who have major depression or bipolar. Peripherally and centrally, there's an imbalance between the pro and the anti-inflammatory processes. We believe this plays not only a role in the comorbidity, but maybe also be playing a role in the etiology of these conditions. During the last 10 years, there's been a renewed interest in the gut biome and the gut biota, the gut bacteria. And this is a work in progress. There's some very compelling evidence now that fecal transplantation can help individuals with C. difficile infection. Both preclinical and clinical evidence indicates that the gut may be playing a role in obesity, diabetes, and metabolic problems. And emerging evidence suggests that in conditions of stress or anxiety or emotional dysregulation, the gut may be playing a role. This is still a work in progress. But this interest in the gut goes back, frankly, uh, to antiquity, but was really renewed in the 1800s uh, with people, for example, like uh, John Harvey Kellogg, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and many others, who identified the link between the gut and the brain in individuals. So more work, indeed, is needed. We've talked in earlier modules about inflammation and its crosstalk with monoamines. Simply put, as inflammation goes up, we see a reduction in the availability of serotonin, catecholamines like dopamine and norepinephrine. And this crosstalk, we believe, helps us explain why so many patients with depression who have increased inflammation 
have increased mood disturbance, impulsivity, problems with cognition, both general cognition and social cognition, as well as cognitive emotional processes. What's really interesting, if we look at other areas of medicine, like diabetes, in preclinical models, what we find is, is that diabetes is also a brain condition. We all, we all know that diabetics have problems with macro and microvascular disease, like cardiovascular disease, but we're also now learning that the brain is adversely affected in diabetes. In animal models, this has been well established, where we see alterations in cellular systems, like the hippocampal neurons, as well as the size of the hippocampus is reduced in animal models of diabetes. What we've recently also discovered is that people who have mood disorders and obesity or diabetes or metabolic syndrome, they've got a very different brain when compared to people who have a mood disorder and don't have obesity or a concurrent metabolic problem. Said differently, when we look at the brain's structure, the brain is smaller, both cortical and white matter. When we look at the circuits, as this uh, data is showing, we find that the circuit integrity is reduced. The functional integrity of the brain is altered in people who have obesity or diabetes while having a mood disorder. So what I like to say is that obesity does metastasize to the brain through the systems of inflammation and insulin resistance. We know that the majority of people with major depression and bipolar have cognitive problems, and in many cases they go on to have Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. We also the type 2 diabetics also have cognitive impairment. And the cognitive impairment seen in type 2 diabetes, type 1 and type 1, is something which is increasingly being realized and recognized because of the longer lifespan of many people who have type 2 diabetes. If it's the case that type 2 diabetics and type 1 have higher rates of mood disorders and cognitive problems, and patients with mood disorders have clearly cognitive problems, it stands to reason that maybe there's a common neurobiological substrate, like insulin dysregulation. We know that insulin is an important neurotrophin. It en enhances neuronal survival and differentiation. It inhibits apoptosis, or premature cell death. We also know that insulin acts as an inhibitor of GSK3 beta. So does lithium, and this reduces some of the phosphorylation processes. Lithium has also been shown to enhance neuroplasticity in the human brain. Keep in mind that insulin is not absolutely essential in the brain for glucose utilization. Insulin serves a trophic neuroprotective role, a modulatory role in the human brain. We've also learned that insulin acts as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And when the brain is in a state of insulin resistance, which is posited in both diabetes and mood disorders, that results in an increased overexpression or an overexpression of monoamine. Consequently, dopamine levels are reduced and people feel apathetic, anhedonic, depressed, and cognitively impaired. So in other words, we believe that insulin resistance in the brain could, for some people, explain some of the domain-based pathology they complain of, like reward disturbances, general cognitive problems, and maybe, in fact, just general disturbances in their overall uh, uh, cognitive emotional processing. There are many other protein systems that are being implicated in the brain from the point of view of reward, appetite, and psychopathology. We won't go through them all here today, but proteins like leptin, adiponectin, resistin, ghrelin, many others are now being implicated in this process. Finally, we're really interested in trying to figure out methodologically how we can measure insulin resistance. We know that people who have Alzheimer's disease seem to have insulin resistance in the brain, so-called type 3 diabetes. We're still, in fact, trying to determine whether people with major depression or bipolar disorder have insulin resistance in the human brain. We know they do in the periphery. There's still a lot of work in this area because brain insulin resistance and peripheral insulin resistance are, in fact, not correlated. One other system I want to introduce to you is the incretin system. This is uh, a system involved uh, in the process of insulin release. It acts as an insulin secretagogue. And GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1. It's released by L cells in the intestine, which serves as an insulin secretagogue in response to a glucose load. We also know that incretins are produced in the nucleus tractus solitarius in the brain. And GLP-1 is a protein that's also abundantly expressed in the reward center of the brain.
We're very interested to see that liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 um, ex um, mimetic, is an exogenous synthetic uh, drug, um, has been demonstrated to be neuroprotective, reducing amyloid, reducing central inflammation, and proliferating, in fact, neuronal cells in animal models. Recently, colleagues in our group have shown that one of the uh, GLP-1 mimetics, like liraglutide, behaves like an antidepressant, maybe even a pro-cognitive strategy in people who have cognitive impairment to begin with, with major depression or bipolar disorder. At the end of the day, we use the information about comorbidity to not only treat patients, but also to better understand what in fact is happening beneath the surface, the neurobiological process. And in later modules, we're going to discuss some very interesting approaches targeting metabolic and inflammatory systems as not only symptom suppressing strategies, but perhaps also disease modifying or curative strategies in mood disorders. Earlier, we talked about sirtuins as transcription factors and maybe relevant to this process. Just to give you an example, caloric restriction, resveratrol, maybe even metformin have been shown to increase sirtuin activity. So taking together this information provides for us a very novel and innovative way of thinking about how can we target the molecules in the brain that are abnormal in individual mood disorders, and how can we treat the disease process that we give patients what has long been needed, that is disease modification and curative therapies, rather than just symptom suppressing therapies. Finally, prevention is the best treatment, and we're learning that if we can just better treat diabetes in the general population, we can reduce the onset of mood disorders. And this is a very important public health statement as we talk about what we can do to reduce the burden of illnesses. We're learning that by understanding the neurobiology of comorbidity and major depression bipolar, this could inform public policy. For example, there should in fact be greater emphasis placed on the prophylactic or preventative properties of better treating diabetes on Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, maybe also major depression and bipolar. So taken together, comorbidity is common, psychiatric and medical, in part because there's common underlying substrates, including but not limited to social determinants and biological determinants. In some cases, comorbidity is an artifact of what's called heterotypic continuity, but we still in fact uh, refer to comorbidity despite the fact that we don't have a zone of delimitation or clarity between uh, the comorbid condition and major depression and bipolar. Finally, this type of information I'm referring to, we hope, informs very novel frameworks for thinking about what we can do to develop very unique and disease-modifying, possibly curative therapies for patients with major depression and bipolar disorder. With this, uh, I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your participation in today's program.